All right, so this is our second class on the book of certitude. In the first class, we mainly introduced the book and read a few paragraphs. And starting this week, we're going to be increasing the pace so that we can get through the book in a, in a reasonable amount of time. And so uh, unlike last week, that means this week we're going to be walking through the paragraphs at a pretty good clip. Um, but I don't want that to mean that if anything really important has been missed, that you shouldn't jump in and uh, and stop me either in that moment or um, or at the end, and we can come back to any points that were that were missed. To recap, first of all, on some of the uh, main ideas from last time, there was so much in those first few paragraphs of the Kitab Egon. Um, and, um, but before even getting into those first few paragraphs, there was the question of what's the context uh, under which the Katabigan was revealed. Um, the uncle of the Bob's questions, which we fortunately have a historical record of, so we know exactly what the Katabigan was revealed in answer to. Um, and we know that those questions of the uncle of the Bob, really a series of questions about the nature of prophecy and prophecy coming, maybe not coming true in ways that are expected. We can maybe reduce the questions of the Bob to, to one simple question, which is why are our expectations around the divine so often unmet? And um, so this goes a little bit beyond the text of the questions themselves, but this is the kind of background for so much of the of the whole text of the Egon. The prophets are always rejected, at least initially. Uh, the divine promises go unfulfilled. Their prophecies don't literally come true. Uh, our faith is tested in so many ways. Um, instead of affirmation and joy, we're often rewarded with doubt and suffering for all of our efforts at reaching the truth of their of their message. Why is this the case? Why would a God who loves us and wants to be known permit this state of affairs. Um, we can say that this is a version of the age-old question of theodicy, uh, the question of the, the justice of God, the existence of evil, the existence of suffering, the mystery of free will. All of these are wrapped up into this question of theodicy. And we can think of the Kitab Egon as one answer to this logical maze, because the problem of theodicy is a, is a problem that people have tried to solve logically, and you just get tied up in knots because you end up having to make assumptions about the nature of the divine, the nature of causality, the relationship between the divine and the world. You end up anthropomorphizing uh, uh, unavoidably uh, the the divine, uh, and so uh, and so any attempt to to write down the answer to theodicy ends up uh, ends up either being like a leaky bucket that uh, that. Uh, that that doesn't really prove anything logically, or that is um, convincing only to those who are already ready and willing to be convinced. Um, we have uh, a de definition of, of theodicy from uh, from the collected wisdom of the internet, that it's a term that marries the quest for understanding the divine with the profound puzzle of human suffering, originating from the Greek words theos and dk. The Odyssey essentially grapples with the question, how can a good, omnipotent, and omniscient God allow evil and suffering to exist in the world? This conundrum sits at the crossroads of philosophy, theology, and the human condition, challenging scholars, seekers, and the spiritually inclined to find coherence in the apparent contradiction between divine goodness and the presence of evil. And we can add to that sort of a larger sort of penumbra of questions around the Odyssey or questions like, why are sacred scriptures written in such an impenetrable style if God wants us to understand them? Why are they such a test to us? Um, and why is it, um, uh, why do divine promises so often go unfulfilled? So part one and part two of the Kitab Egon are in their own way answers to this question of theodicy. So also last time, and this was from the um, from the first two paragraphs of the Kitab Egon, we start with a, a kind of a promise. Something's being promised to us. Um, we can call it certitude, we can call it faith, we can call it true understanding, we can call it a way out of the problem of theodicy that Baha'u'llah is offering in this book. And the way out is different from 
the logical knowing of things. It's different from knowing something in the bookish sense of the word. It's different from someone being able to just write down the answer and you're reading it and comprehending it. There's something beyond that that cannot actually be captured with words, but words are the necessary vehicle, vehicle for expressing ideas from one mind to another, at least at least in time. Um, at least one one of the I won't say the only the only vehicle for expressing ideas, but um, another being art, another being music. Um, other ways of communicating uh, ideas and spirit from one mind to another. But the, but the means that the prophets use are words. And these words are paltry receptacles for conveying those mysteries. Uh, and of a necessity, metaphors have to be used to, to, to at least get in the direction of, get in the vicinity of the meaning of the thing they're trying uh, to convey. Metaphors such as catching a fragrance, hearing a song, entering a city, and so forth. And we find the Kitabi Gan is filled with these sorts of uh, of metaphors. I want to suggest that we try to leave these words, certitude, igan, faith, iman, true understanding, erfan, these key words that we come across so often in the Baha'i writings, try to bracket them in your head as placeholders or for now for something that maybe that word is a, a very imperfect representation of, um, because the thing itself that Baha'u'llah is trying to, um, trying to describe can only be alluded to uh, by the words themselves. So also in the first couple of paragraphs, Baha'u'llah uh, gives us some initial clues as to what is needed to attain this thing that he's promising us, this certitude. Um, one of them being pure intention, a kind of an emptying out, a detachment, purity of heart, um, setting aside the opinions of others, idle talk, uh, and so forth, um, which seems on the face of it a little bit contra, counterintuitive because we think of learning as filling ourselves up with knowledge. And what Baha'u'llah is asking is that we empty ourselves out. And I suggest that what we're looking at here is the difference between a, a person as a container into which knowledge is poured in the sense of in the sense of ilm knowledge, uh, and a person as a reed through which the breath of the spirit is blown to create divine melodies. That's more the, the mode of, of Arafan. Um, and to achieve that mode of Arafan, the pith of self has to be blown out so that the so that the reed can make uh, can make the melody. So the two are complementary in a way almost opposite in the in the in the in the means of of, uh, of attaining them, also Baha'u'llah in the in those first couple of paragraphs mentions uh, one of the prerequisites of attaining certitude as trust in God, um, which might strike us as a kind of logical circularity because if the thing we're trying to achieve is certitude in God, then how do we start with trust in God as as you know the the provision of the journey? Um, if the starting point is the end point, what's happening here? Um, we might. Consider this as a kind of tension between the idea of a scientific method is applied to religion, you know, examining, logically parsing something, uh, and what the prophets themselves say, what especially Baha'u'llah says about his own writings, which is that they justify themselves. They are their own standard. We should not weigh this against any other standard other than itself. How is this not a circular argument? It seems that it's a system that can only be understood from the, from the inside. But I'll suggest that it's in that way resembling something like a story or a poem or a piece of music. You don't take the composer's word for it that they've written an amazing song. You listen to the song. And listening to the song is a complete act. It is a, a momentary embrace of the thing offered on its own terms. And then the proof of it lies in the effect it has. Thirdly, Baha'u'llah mentions as a prerequisite to attainment the reading correctly of what kind of a thing scripture is. Uh, Joseph Campbell famously said that one of the great problems with interpretation of religion is that people read their religious scriptures out um, as though they're prose, but really they should be read as poetry. Uh, and I think that's a, a really concise way even of summarizing part one of the Kitab Yigan, where so many people have taken these prophecies and Baha'u'llah highlights a prophecy of the Bible, and they've read it out as prose. They've read it out as a sequence of factual statements 
whereas they should be read out instead as poetry, and poetry has a different kind of modality of expression. Also last time, um, the first two paragraphs uh, invite us to a, a, a means of investigating spiritual reality, which has consequences, like real world consequences. Uh, one of which is, Baha'u'llah is inviting us to assume a kind of interrogative posture with regard to matters of belief, and particularly with regard to claims of authority in regard to matters of belief. Baha'u'llah, in the opening of the Kitab Yigan, is basically saying, take no one's word for it, high or low, member of the clergy, common person, they are not the standard by which to judge the truth of divine verses. This implies a profound reconfiguring of power relationships in the world, uh, which, which uh, so much of which are, are based in one way or another upon uh, what we might call clerical, uh, clerical uh, influences. Um, certainly in the um, in the in the in the realm of, of of religions, but I would argue that this I, this idea of independent investigation of reality also applies uh, equally to our relationships uh, regarding power in the secular world. It also I think implies that every generation must discover its spiritual truths anew. We can no longer assume that people will simply follow the religion of one's forefathers. If one reads the Kitab Yigan, each generation reads and says, oh, well, I can't just take the word of this person of authority, including my own parents. One has to rediscover the truth of religion and make it new and make it fresh and make it relevant from generation to generation. Otherwise, we're just repeating the same mistakes of, of the people of the past who ended up basing religious faith on tradition and on claims of authority rather than on uh, this, this, its own standard, which can only be, uh, pr which can only be grasped by the by the independent investigation of reality. So, um, with that maybe too long introduction um, or or recap, this time we're going to do a walkthrough of, of paragraph seven through forty four, um, and then um, towards the end we'll share some some thoughts. Um, on, uh, on a few different topics. So to aid us in this walkthrough, um, again, which is gonna be maybe too fast, we'll see how fast it goes. Uh, we have a study outline, which I've put on the share drive. Um, this is only, of course, one way of outlining it. You'll notice if you look, um, if you just glance at it, you'll notice that it's not, um, it's not an outline that takes each paragraph necessarily sequentially, but I, do a little bit of creative rearrangement of the paragraphs where I feel like it best captures the logical flow. And so you'll sometimes see a paragraph of a lower number come after paragraphs of higher number in this particular outline. So we're gonna be looking at um, up to paragraph 44, um, which is about half of part one of the Kitab uh, and we're gonna see Baha'u'llah examining the question of the rejection of the prophet's past, uh, and the cause of that rejection, we're going to see Baha'u'llah looking at a number of a handful of prophets uh, of the Arabian Peninsula and of the and of the Old and New, Old and New Testaments. Uh, we're going to look at the cause of that rejection, which is going to move to um, what one of the causes being the lack of understanding of the of the scriptures. We then uh, move on to Baha'u'llah's exegesis or um, interpretation of some of the verses revealed to the prophets of old showing us the way to reading out the uh, divine uh, divine verses as as poetry rather than than as prose. So starting we're, we're starting at paragraph seven um, and what I've done just for convenience is just scanned my copy of the Gone, um, which has some annotations in it that um, maybe this will help a little bit. Um, in my version of the gone, I've annotated it with you know with different color pens and with different little signal uh, different symbols to connect it to different um, uh, commentaries that exist. You know, Mr. Dunbar's commentary uh, and a companion of the set of the gone is uh, is marked when there's you know when there's a uh, an entry in his companion. I try to to mark it in the text um, with a little D. Um, 
if uh, if a paragraph in Egon is quoted either in Gleanings or in the World Order of Baha'u'llah, in the Dispensation of Baha'u'llah, Shoghi Effendi's letter, either in either of those cases, I take that as a as a kind of additional underlining that that Shoghi Effendi considered this to be important enough either to extract it and translate it in Gleanings or to quote it in uh, in the Dispensation letter, uh, which gives a kind of extra weight and importance to that uh, paragraph, and I look at it a little bit more closely. Also, there's a famous um, and very long commentary um, on the Kitab Igan uh, by uh, Eshrat Khavari called Khamusi Igan. Uh, and I've marked up a lot of those. Uh, we won't really be referring to, I think, very much. I, I don't imagine we're going to be getting into that much into the weeds with these sorts of commentaries, which in, in many cases are looking at very de detailed uh Detailed questions that, uh, that we are primarily going to be uh, skipping over uh, unless uh, unless there is a desire to, to to discuss them in particular. So we're starting with paragraph seven then. So ab after introducing the, this problem of the prophets being rejected in various ways, uh, Abd uh, Baha'u'llah says we're going to relate to um, uh, diverse accounts relative to these prophets. He begins with Noah. Um, and he mentions um, the the scorn of the people heaped upon Noah as he uh, as as he uh, claimed uh, declared uh, his mission. And Baha'u'llah also refers to a, a non fulfillment of the divine promise. So it wasn't just that that Noah was rejected by those around him, but he made certain promises that were not even fulfilled. Uh, and this is you can check this in uh, in Mr. Dunbar's commentary. The details of that it actually is not itself in the Old Testament or in the Quran, but it's found in, in some of the Hadith literature, exactly what was promised and what was not fulfilled. Uh, many of Noah's followers uh, turned away. Uh, Baha'u'llah even cites two different Hadiths. You know, it's either 40 or 72 followers remained after this uh, after this incident of, of non-fulfillment. Um, and then Baha'u'llah asks, what was the cause of their rejection? And what was the cause of the non-fulfillment of the divine promise, which led the seekers to reject that which they had accepted? So Baha'u'llah says, meditate profoundly about this, the secret that the secret of things might be unveiled to you, uh, that you may acknowledge the truth that from time immemorial, even unto eternity, the Almighty hath tried and will continue to try his servants so that light may be distinguished from darkness, truth from falsehood, right from wrong, guidance from error, happiness from misery, and roses from thorns. This is kind of in one sentence, one answer to the problem of the Odyssey. You know, the reason there's evil and suffering, the reason there are, are tests, it has something to do with a, div a divine process of weighing that must take place. Why that has to take place is not explained, but the, the fact is asserted that roses need to be distinguished from thorns, and this is how it's done. We're going to come back to this um, at the end uh, and return to this point. So after mentioning Noah, Baha'u'llah then mentions Hud and Saleh, who we haven't heard of if we've only read the Bible, but these are prophets of the Arabian Peninsula that are mentioned in the in the Quran. Similar story for each of those. Um, he mentions the friend of God, Abraham. Similar story there. And then he comes to Moses and spends a little bit more uh, more time uh, on Moses. But the story, as Baha'u'llah warns us at the beginning, uh, indicates at the beginning, is the is the same story uh, being told uh, from age to age. And again, he pauses after the story of Moses and says. What could have caused such contention and conflict? I, I, I box each question mark just to remind myself that part one of the Kitab Begun is filled with questions. Baha'u'llah is giving us a little facts and he's asking us to think about it, us to meditate and ponder what is going on here because what's happening is not obvious. It's not obvious, particularly if we believe in the, in the infinite omnipotence and benevolence of God, then all of these different things that are happening, all of the, you know, the history of the prophets, is quite mystifying to us, unless there's some other principle uh, involved. So Baha'u'llah asks, why is it that the advent of every true manifestation of God hath been accompanied by such strife and tumult, by such tyranny and upheaval? 
This notwithstanding the fact that all the prophets of God, whenever made manifest unto the peoples of the world, have invariably foretold the coming of yet another prophet after them, and have established such signs as would herald the advent of the future dispensation. To this, the records of all sacred books bear witness. Why then is it that despite the expectation of men in their quest of the manifestation of holiness, and in spite of the signs recorded in the sacred books, such acts of violence, of oppression, and cruelty should have been perpetrated in every age and cycle against all the prophets and chosen ones of God? And then he brings it up to the present day, because ultimately he's trying to explain and justify the claims of the Bab in relation to the vehement denial of the Islamic clergy. Whatever in days gone by hath been the cause of the denial and opposition of those people hath now led to the perversity of the people of this age. So it's all the same story up to and including um, the, the revelation of the Bab and the reason for the rejection of the revelation of the Bab. And then he, he deals and, and discards one possible explanation. And that explanation is that the testimony of providence was incomplete. Well, we didn't have all the facts. So that's why we rejected the Bab. Um, and Baha'u'llah uh, categorically uh, dismisses that possible explanation. So that's just open blasphemy. He says, how far from the grace of the all bountiful to single out a soul from amongst all men for the guidance of his creatures. And on the one hand, to withhold from him the full measure of his divine testimony, and on the other, inflict severe retribution on his people for having turned away from his chosen one. So he says, no, in, in every age, the people have had what they needed to make the correct judgment as to the truth or falsity of, uh, of the prophet. Baha'u'llah says, having weighed the testimony of God by the standard of their own knowledge, gleaned from the teachings of the leaders of their faith, and found it at variance with their limited understanding, they arose to perpetrate such unseemly acts. And then again, he, he now fingers the leaders of religion in particular, and we're going to come back to this point also at the end. It's a really interesting point. Because here in paragraph 15, he says, true. leaders of religion in every age have hindered their people from attaining the shores of eternal salvation, inasmuch they held, as they held the reins of authority in their mighty grasp. And he says, some for the loss of leadership, others for want of knowledge and understanding. Uh, but this was the, these are the, these are the main culprits, Baha'u'llah says, uh, are the leaders of religion, the clergy. Um, then he asks, um, he asks in paragraph 16 again, he, um, he said, look, scan for a while the horizon of divine knowledge and contemplate those words of perfection which the eternal hath revealed that happily the mysteries of divine wisdom, hidden ere now beneath the veil of glory and treasured within the tabernacle of his grace may be made manifest unto you. And then he gives them a kind of an out. You know, he doesn't say that it, this was an act of bad faith on their part. He says, the denials and protestations of these leaders of religion have in the main been due to their lack of knowledge and understanding. And hence they raised the standard of revolt, stirred up mischief and in sedition. He said, it is obvious and manifest that the true meaning of the utterances of the birds of eternity is revealed to none except those that manifest the eternal being and the melodies of the nightingale of holiness can reach no ear save that of the denizens of the everlasting realm. This is another interesting sort of circularity because he's saying, and he's setting up for the whole rest of part one of the Kitab Yigan, which is going to be an exegesis of actual um, symbolic uh, references and prophecies. But what he says is the only ones who can understand these prophecies are those who are in some way specially anointed or appointed of God, which is, well, so who gets to do it? Well, it's not us. It's not us mortals who, who can read and understand these things. They have to be interpreted to us. So what's Baha'u'llah doing here? Maybe one thing he's doing is this is kind of, at this point, he has not yet declared his own mission, although he has known his own mission from, from that, that moment in the Siach Hall already um, some time ago. Perhaps what he's implying um, is that if one accepts the proposition that really only a prophet can correctly interpret 
the prophecies of the previous prophet, then what Baha'u'llah is doing right now in the Kitab Yagan is implicitly a kind of a kind of proclamation of his own station as a prophet, although he has not yet made that uh, made that station clear uh, and has has not yet publicly declared that uh, that station. But it's an interesting point, and we, we might uh, we might discuss this also at, at some point um, uh, after we reach the uh, after we reach the end of the of this series of paragraphs. He then moves to the um, to the to Jesus and the tests and trials of Jesus, uh, and he connects the rejection of Jesus, again, specifically setting up for the rest of the of part one of the Egon, that Israel, meaning the, the, the Jewish people, uh, and particularly the leaders, um, refuse to apprehend the meaning of such words as have been revealed in the Bible concerning the signs of the coming revelation. And he says, and they still await his coming. Um, and then, he uh, and this is this is I, a, a, I think a really key point as to why Baha'u'llah spends so much time interpreting biblical prophecies to the Shiite Muslim uncle of the Bab. Why would that be a good strategy for making a case for the claim of the Bab? And one reason why one would want to do that is because. As a believing Muslim, the uncle of the Bab must believes also in the divinity of the Bible and the divinity of Jesus, and also believes that Jesus must have foretold the coming of Muhammad as a, as a believing Muslim. And so in pointing out to this believing Muslim that these verses of the Bible have to be understood metaphorically, in order to get to the revelation of Muhammad, Baha'u'llah is making a point that his interlocutor can't can't deny. I mean, the uncle of the Bab has to admit that you have to read these these verses of the Bible metaphorically in order to get to uh, and justify the the claim of of Muhammad. And having done that, it's in a much smaller step to say, well, maybe the same thing is required also of the Quran. Maybe just as we're going to have to interpret the Bible in metaphorical terms, uh, maybe we're also going to have to interpret the Quran in metaphorical terms as well. So Baha'u'llah made a similar point also previously. The Kitab Yagan is not the first place where he did this. Uh, it, and uh, fortunately, we have uh, in authorized English translation, um, the other main place where Baha'u'llah did this, and this is Gems of Divine Mysteries, which, which he alludes to here in paragraph 18, uh, in our former tablets, he says it in the in the plural, but he's referring to that single tablet, uh, which were addressed to a friend in the melodious language of Hejaz. So, Gems of Divine Mysteries was revealed in Arabic. This book is revealed in in Persian. But both of them take up the same verses of the Bible and interpret those same verses of the Bible. Yeah, Darius. Uh, just a quick question: it, What was to what extent at this time in the 19th century was um, the Quran read literally versus the understanding of the need for metaphor? Like how literalist was society at that point? Oh, I don't know if I can answer that that well. I think it's probably, I mean, it's pretty literalist now, right? Yeah. As <laughs> I, is I don't think it would have trended more literal yeah. in, in the last century or two. Um, but... But I don't know if that's the right answer because you know when when you ask that question with really in really regard to Christianity, I I feel like there's been a kind of trend towards increasing literalism in Christianity, particularly in evangelical Christianity, and that trend really only goes back a century or so. Mm. Um, you go back to say Saint Augustine, and Aquinas, and others. It's like when they re, you know when they read and, and and provide commentaries on say the Book of Genesis. They're not reading it out as a historical text necessarily. They're, they, they, and these are people who, who lived, you know, over a thousand, you know, a thousand years ago in the case of uh, over a thousand years ago in the case of Augustine, and so um, 1500, 60, whatever, many years ago, um, and so the trend isn't all, always necessarily towards a more elaborate or sophisticated um, interpretation of things. Uh, I don't, I don't have a, a, a great sense of of 
of the sort of sophistication of interpretation of the Quran in the Muslim world, particularly in the Shiite Muslim world over the last century or two. Great, thank you. So Bahal is referring to having done this previously in- um, Well, I do, I do know what, what, yeah. one little thing I know, and maybe Shaheen might know a little more about this too, like the return of the 12th Imam, like in Shiite Islam, the majority of people thought that he'd physically been alive the entire time from when the the twelfth Imam disappeared. That it that it was literally when he was returning, he had been alive and hiding among us, literally for like a, a thousand years or something like that. So there was a great deal of literalism. Uh, not there's not any kind of return, as in. Muhammad is the return of Christ. That that didn't really apply. That that's one that's one small mm -hmm. thing. I guess. And yeah. also, Stephen, I think you actually uh, mentioned that in the first session. That was one of the questions of the Bob of how can the Bob fulfill this one prophecy of yeah. of the Messiah? Correct. That's right. Yeah. And similarly, we have the questions that led to the um, to the revelation of gems of divine mysteries, and they're very similar in their very kind of literalistic tone. Like, well, it is known that, you know, the city, you know, of Jabalqa and Jabarsa, the, the twin cities have this number of gates and they're this size and dimensions, but where is it? It's not on the earth. And um, and so Baha what what we do know is that Baha'u'llah was dealing with very literal minded people. Um, I think in, in any large enough population, you'll find a minority who are quite sophisticated in their in their interpretation. And and perhaps we in the West might focus on those. You know, we look at say the great uh, the great tradition of of um, philosophy in the Arab world. You know, from from the early you know centuries after the the life of of Muhammad, and there was incredible sophistication there. Um, and later in the in the um, Shiite Muslim world, in the especially in the in the Persian world, there was also a um, a very sophisticated tradition of of what you would call illuminationist philosophy, which is kind of a blending of, you know, Platonism and Neoplatonism with uh, with a kind of mystical take on Islam, but was, but was at the same time very intellectually rigorous. Um, those sorts of people wouldn't have uh, probably fallen prey to the same sort of literalistic um, sort of rabbit holes that that uh, that, the, that the clergy did. But um, and um, and and when we study, when we in the West try to study, you know, the history of Islam, I don't know if we have a, a good sense in our head of what like the relative sort of weighting of these are. You know, we might overweight these highly sophisticated works and think, oh, this was like this represented the pinnacle or the, or the, even the majority view, and maybe maybe the majority view has always been uh, much more simplistic. Um, but this question, actually, and we're gonna we're gonna get back to this really interesting question. Which is who's who's responsible for this mess? You know, is it the people and their simplistic takes on things, or is it the the leaders who are foisting these simplistic takes off on the people? Uh, and what we saw in paragraph what was it paragraph fourteen uh, is we saw uh, in paragraph fifteen uh, Baha'u'llah saying, well, it was the leaders who are responsible for this, and and it's their misunderstandings and their liter literalistic interpretation of things. Uh, and once we uh, return to this at the end, we're going to see that even Baha'u'llah puts a lot more a nuance into that uh, into that answer. So, um, so Baha'u'llah is now set up for the remainder of, of part one of the of the Kitab Yigan, which is now turning to the question of exegesis, turning to the question of uh, of interpretation of of prophecy, uh, and Baha'u'llah yeah, begins with a couple of 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 comments, uh, a couple of references to statements by uh, by Jesus, uh, clearly anticipating that there was going to be a return, uh, that he was going to leave and then come back again, um, uh, and referring also to in the dispensation of the Quran that the book and cause of Jesus were were affirmed, um, asserting the that um, that really there is. Uh, there is no essential difference between the person of Jesus and the person of Muhammad uh, and of his holy book, inasmuch as both have championed the cause of God, uttered his praise, and revealed his commandments. 
This is an anticipation of what we're going to see in much more detail in part two of the Egon, this assertion of the essential unity uh, of the prophets. But this is an opportunity for Baha'u'llah to bring uh, out this, um, this metaphor of the sun, that you know the sun rises from a slightly different spot in the horizon you know, each day, but we don't, we don't call it a different sun. Um, although we could call it a different sun if we wanted to. We could say, well, that was the sun of yesterday, and this is the sun of today. And Baha'u'llah says, you'd be right if you said that. Uh, but at the same time, if you um, if you said that um, that it's the same sun as the sun of yesterday, you would also be right. And then Baha'u'llah says, in like manner, if it be said that all the days are but one and the same, it is also correct and true. And if it be said with respect to their particular names and designations that they differ, again, that is true. For though they are the same, yet one doth recognize in each a separate designation, a specific attribute, a particular character. This is all in anticipation of um, of of part two of the Kitab Um and and we have an even even more um, uh, even more uh, explicit uh, anticipation in the next sentence, where it says, "Conceive accordingly the distinction, the variation, and unity characteristic of the various manifestations of holiness, that thou mayest comprehend the allusions made by the Creator of all names and attributes to the mysteries of distinction and unity, and discover the answer to thy question." as to why that everlasting beauty should have at sundry times called himself by different names and titles. And now he turns to the, um, to the centerpiece of his exegesis, and he takes a few paragraphs to, to sort of work up to it. He says, Afterwards, the companions and disciples of Jesus asked him concerning those signs that must need signalize the return of his manifestation. When they ask, shall these things be? Several times they questioned that peerless beauty, and every time he made reply, he set forth a special sign, a special verse, that should herald the advent of the promised dispensation. To this testify the records of the four Gospels. And so we have, um, I have in my notes down below, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, very clear, and, and, and in John as well, there is... Um, sort of corresponding uh, text about this particular prophecy. Uh, Baha'u'llah says he's only going to cite one of these instances, but this is really the central one. Um, it's the one that uh, that has easily th the greatest amount of detail. But before introducing that major uh, that major prophecy in the uh, in the New Testament, he takes a moment to to make what we might in retrospect with 2020 hindsight say, uh, say sounds a bit like a kind of veiled declaration because he says I'm now going to reveal you the meaning of this but having said already that only the prophets are able to correctly uh, do this uh, Baha'u'llah is kind of skirting on the edge of saying uh, of claiming that same prophetic power for himself over the next uh, couple of paragraphs um, and then he yeah, sorry yes. when did he when when did Baha'u'llah in this context, receive understand that he was a manifestation, although he had not announced it. How long? That's right. Like, so so the, it was in the Siach Cha that Baha'u'llah describes that he was visited by the maid of heaven. Although Abdu'l Baha tells us in some answer questions that they always knew it. So there's some there's some question as to to what extent they were fully aware of their own station during their childhood years and from, you know, their first memories and so forth. And we'll never know the answer to that. And I'm, and I'm sure different people will have different, different answers. But Baha'u'llah himself tells us about a, a signal moment uh, in which he was, you know, particularly awakened to the, to his, his divine mission. And that happened in the, in the Siach Chal. Um, and uh, it happened before, obviously before he was exiled to, to Iraq. Uh, and we don't know the the exact day or even the exact month that it happened, uh, but it happened. Um, am I getting the year right? It, it happened around the year eighteen um, fifty one, I think. It was not long after the martyrdom of the Bab, which was in eighteen fifty. Bahala was, uh, and then the attempt on the on the Shah's life that happened soon after that, and then Bahala was thrown into the Siach Shah as a consequence of that. So this all happened in succession around the year eighteen fifty one maybe January 1852, I can't remember exactly, but it's right around that time. Whereas right. the Kitabi Igan was revealed um, in, uh, I might've said in, in my last slides, around 1860, 1861. 
So we have a passage of around 10 years when Baha'u'llah was still concealing the messianic secret. And this is a, sort of the last stage of that sort of concealment of the messianic secret when it's almost it's almost sort of breaking out. You know, you can sort of little flashes of light are coming out here and there. And then the whole thing erupts on the on the day of uh, on the days of, of Rezvan in uh, in April of uh, of 1863, and it sort of comes out fully in, into the open, or at least more fully than it had before. So Baha'u'llah then, uh, having introduced what, what he's going to be doing in paragraph 24, delivers the uh, the the quotation, and he's and he's quoting from Matthew, although very similar statements are found in the in the other Gospels that immediately after the oppression of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of earth shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And that was quoted in Arabic, and then he himself translates it into Persian and says the same thing in Persian. And what happens over the next many dozens of paragraphs up until the end of part one is Baha'u'llah now goes through sequentially and describes what is meant by oppression, what is meant by sun and moon and stars, and, um, and what is meant by the clouds, the clouds of heaven. That's a big one. Um, and the angels and the trumpet and so forth. So we're going to get an exegesis of, of all of these, which we will be um, um, not 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 doing perhaps complete justice to it because uh, because of time constraints. So Baha'u'llah says, inasmuch as the Christian divines have failed to apprehend the meaning of these words and did not recognize their object and purpose, and have clung to the literal interpretation, it gives us the, the divines he's singling out clung to the literal interpretation of the words of Jesus, they therefore became deprived of the streaming grace of the Mohammedan revelation and its showering bounties. Like, What stronger argument could he make for interpreting, uh, for, for interpreting, having to interpret the Quran in the same way to, to be able to recognize the claims of him whom God should make manifest, whoever that happens to be. Of course, Baha'u'llah saying it's the Bab. Um, and then besides this passage, he, he references another, uh, another verse of the gospel where he says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Um, and says that people have mistakenly also literally interpreted this to mean that the, the law of the gospel shall never be annulled. Um, and uh, which Baha'u'llah will argue is, is not the case because the law of each preceding dispensation is superseded by the law of the subsequent uh, dispensation. So now he says, I'm going to share with you a dewdrop of the fathomless ocean of the truths treasured in these holy words, uh, beginning with the matter of oppression. So that as to these words immediately after the oppression of those days, and it's such an incredible description of the present day. It's just amazing. They refer to the time when men shall become oppressed and afflicted, the time when the lingering traces of the sun of truth and the fruit of the tree of knowledge and wisdom will have vanished from the midst of men, when the reins of mankind will have fallen into the grasp of the foolish and ignorant, when the portals of divine unity and understanding, the essential and highest purpose in creation will have been closed, when certain knowledge will have given way to idle fancy and corruption will have usurped the station of righteousness. Such a condition as this is witnessed in this day. Again, he's jumping between the time of Jesus and, the, and, and this moment, uh, it witnessed in this day when the reins of every community have fallen into the grasp of foolish leaders who lead after their own whim and desire. And he gives uh, more on this more on this theme. Uh, he singles out the Muslim uh, divines for a particular uh, for a particular mention in paragraph twenty eight, where he lists not uh, kind of gives this incredible ninefold description of what they're like, that their hearts are, are basically closed to the truth. And then the sort of the real sort of kicker as to describing what, what is really meant by oppression, because it's not literally that people are tied up and thrown in jail. It's a different sort of oppression, um, although that also happens. Uh, and, there, and there are oppressions of that more, uh, of that, uh, of that more tangible sort, 
Baha'u'llah here is referring to the more intangible kind of oppression. He says, what oppression is more grievous than that a soul seeking the truth and wishing to attain unto the knowledge of God should know not where to go for it and from whom to seek it? For opinions have so sorely differed, and the ways unto the attainment of God have multiplied. This oppression is the essential feature of every revelation. Unless it cometh to pass, the Son of Truth will not be made manifest. For the break of the morn of divine guidance must needs follow the darkness of the night of error. Again, it's not a matter even that the truth has been suppressed. It's not the suppression of those days. It's that you don't know where to find it. It's out there. I mean, it's an internet search away, but the internet is 99% noise and 1% signal. Um, and when you're there at the search prompt and you're one search away from, from truth, um, how does that help you if you don't know what the search phrase is? So, Stephen? Yes. May I ask this term, Urvatul Wutka? Yes. Yes, I had a note on this too. It's it means it's it's a phrase from the Quran and it means the sure handle. Okay. Um, and Abdu'l Baha explains this is in God passes by, so it's quoted by Shoghi Effendi that the sure handle mentioned in the scriptures of old is not else but the covenant and testament. So that phrase is used actually in the Baha'i writings fairly often uh, okay. to refer. So when you see the phrase sure handle, you do like a Google search on that or something in the Baha'i writings, and, and that's Urvatul Voska. Oh, okay, thank you. So he moves on then from oppression, he says, and clarifies further in paragraph 30, that by oppression is meant the want of capacity to acquire spiritual knowledge and apprehend the word of God. Then he moves on to the meaning of the sun and the moon. And here he gives lots of different definitions for it. Uh, he spends a lot of time on, on the sun and the moon. So his first definition of the sun and the moon, uh, the sun being darkened and the moon not giving its light and the stars, of course, falling from heaven. Uh, he means, first of all, by the term sun and moon are meant, uh, are meant those suns who rise from the day spring of ancient glory and fill the world with a liberal effusion of grace from on high. The sons of truth are the universal manifestations of God. So what does it mean then that they fall from heaven? Of course, not that they literally fall from heaven, but that their message in the world is, uh, is obscured. That these divine luminaries, he says, seem to be confined at times to specific designations and attributes, as you have observed and are now observing, is due solely to the imperfect and limited comprehension of certain minds. So there is a kind of clouds that may get in the way between the sun of truth and the earth. And that's totally a function of the clouds. It's not a function of, the, of those sons of truth themselves. They keep on shining. Then he says also by the term sons, sometimes is referring to these immaculate souls. The, in a Shiite context, he's referring to the imams of the faith, those successors uh, to Muhammad of whom there were, uh, there were 12 in number the 12th having disappeared under obscure circumstances um, and the Bab having claimed to be the return of that of that 12th Imam. Um, he then gives another, um, another explanation of the term son. Uh, he says in another uh, sense, it, it intended the divines of the former dispensation. So the, they may have had their moment in the sun. They may have had a, you know, a time when they were the a cause of upliftment of, of a civilization. Uh, and of leading a, a people rightly, uh, but that that um, but that that also fades in in time uh, until they become more uh, more a cause of darkness than than light. Uh, he refers to the sun being applied to these leaders of religion in paragraph thirty six due to their lofty position and their fame and their renown. Um, uh, such are the universally recognized divines of every age who speak with authority and whose fame is securely established. Uh, another mention of this sure handle. Um, and um, and then giving another description, another uh, another interpretation of sun and moon and stars, which are the laws and teachings as have been established and proclaimed in every dispensation, such as the laws of prayer and fasting. So those for a time have force, 
are followed by people scrupulously, reverently, uh, with with faith and with love, uh, and that at some point the those laws also cease to to have their force and cease to be followed uh, by the people. He gives a special uh, shout out to uh, to prayer and fasting as as being particular representatives of that sun and moon of the of the divine teachings. Uh, probably, and he doesn't say it explicitly, but probably referring to the to how in in sort of modern in in modernist Muslim countries, uh, people have to try to get not get around the law of fasting. People still follow the law of fasting, but they may sleep during the day and then just you know be awake during night, for example, to sort of avoid the avoid the um, uh, the discomfort of the of the fast and and avoid the the spiritual purpose of it. Um, so that's one way in which the you know the luminosity of a law may fade in time as people find ways of of following the law to the letter, but in a way that doesn't provide uh, that doesn't provide the spiritual benefit of it. He says it is clear and manifest that by the words the sun shall be darkened and the moon uh, shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. It is intended the waywardness of the divines and the annulment of laws firmly established by divine revelation all of which in symbolic language have been foreshadowed by the manifestations of God. So this gets us to the sort of, to the end of this portion of his exegesis of the, um, of the, uh, uh, of these passages from the new Testament. And then he does something really interesting. Um, he kind of takes flight, you know, he's on the, he's sort of on the ground. He's saying this, uh, what this means, this is what that means. And then for a couple of paragraphs, it's like a bird that sort of takes off on the from the ground and now is soaring in the air. And he's saying, with fixed gaze and steady wings, enter thou the way of certitude and truth. And this is just full of, of references to um uh the the what in, in Sufi terms has been called the um the the knowledge of certitude and the eye of certitude and the truth of certitude, which are like different degrees of certitude. He's like ascend. The levels of certitude, you know, there's the degree of certitude, which is just knowing about something. And then there's a degree of certitude, which is seeing it with your own eyes. And then there's a degree of certitude, which is experiencing it deeply in your own being. And he's trying to invoke this in the reader. He's trying to uplift the reader to this sort of higher station. He says, oh, my brother, take thou the step of the spirit, so that swift as the twinkling of an eye, thou mayest flash through the wilds of remoteness and bereavement attain the resvan of everlasting reunion and in one breath commune with the heavenly spirits for with human feet thou canst never hope to traverse these immeasurable distances nor attain thy goal we're reminded of in um, another one of his tablets where he promises us that that this surging ocean is near astonishingly near unto us he says behold it is closer than our life's vein and that's swift as a twinkling of an eye. If we but wish it, we can attain it. So there's a kind of absolutely mystical assurance that the thing that's being promised is not any distance away. You know, it's right there. It's like, it's just behind a very thin veil. And piercing through the veil is what he's trying to encourage uh, the reader to do. So that takes us up to paragraph 44. And what happens later, another thing that he's doing is he's saying, take the step of the spirit. He's also taking kind of an interpretive leap. And for a bunch of paragraphs, he goes and soars away from the interpretation of the New Testament. And he starts talking about some Quranic verses. And then he lands, the bird lands in a, in, in a few dozen pages and he comes back to the uh, to finish off his interpretation of the, of the New Testament. So, let me summarize with just making a few a few observations that hopefully will spark conversation um, and uh, and discussion about this. And the first one is assigning responsibility. So who is responsible for this mess of religion going through this terrible period where there's a new religion but nobody believes in it? You know the mess the world is is currently in today. And you might think, well, the answer is clear. It's paragraph 14. Baha'u'llah says, well, it's the leaders of religion. They're responsible. We're not responsible. The clergy are responsible. 
you know, leaders of religion in every age have hindered their people from attaining the shores of eternal salvation in as much as they held the reins of authority in their mighty grasp. So we get to kind of wash our hands of it. We're, you know, tools uh, in, in the, in the uh, marionettes being, our strings being pulled by forces larger than us. But that's not the whole story. Because in another tablet, and this is in the Lahi Nasir, which was revealed many years, uh, a few years later, about eight or nine years later, or maybe six or seven years later after the Kitab Yigan. This is a late Adrianople period tablet. Baha'u'llah takes up the same theme, and he says the opposite thing. He says, the foremost divines of the age have arisen in opposition and enmity. Although the opposition of such souls is to outward seeming the cause of the opposition of the people, in reality, the people are the cause of the rejection of these divines. What's going on here? Why is Baha'u'llah you know, saying exactly the opposite thing here that he did in, uh, in the Kitab Yigan? So is Baha'u'llah just being inconsistent or is there some deeper principle at work? So let me suggest that the, there is a deeper principle at work and it has something to do with chapter 44 of some answer questions where Abdu'l Baha is asked a question about why it is that God sometimes rebukes the prophets. Uh, and this is a question of Laura Clifford Barney. Certain words of rebuke have been addressed to the prophets of God in the sacred scriptures. To whom are they addressed? And to whom do they ultimately refer? And Abdu'l Baha takes a whole chapter to say this, but the summary of it is, 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 nicely, uh, is nicely seen here in the first few words of the answer, which is that every divine utterance that takes the form of a rebuke though it be outwardly addressed to the prophets of God, is in reality directed to their followers. The wisdom of this is not but unalloyed mercy, that the people might not be dismayed, disheartened, or burdened by such reproaches and rebukes. So God's being nice to us by not saying it's our fault and putting it all, if, if, if it's true that, that we can sort of transpose this answer also to the answer of why it is that the clergy were blamed in the Kitab Yigan when, when really the, the people were, were at fault, as, as Baha'u'llah later says in the in the Lohi Nasir. Um, just as a as a as a nice aside, uh Kipling had a beautiful, beautiful um poem about this. Um maybe my wife could read it so so I can um because my throat is getting a bit dry. Oh sure. Thanks, Captain. The disciple, he that hath a gospel to loose upon mankind, though he serve it utterly, body, soul, and mind, though he go to cavalry daily for its gain, it is his disciple shall make his labor vain. He that hath a gospel for all the earth to own, though he etch it, in the, it on the steel or carve it on the stone, not to be misdoubted through the, through the after days, it is his disciple shall read it many ways. It is his disciple, ere those bones are dust, who shall change the charter, who shall split the trust, amplify distinctions, rationalize the claim, preaching that the master would have done the same. It is his disciple who shall tell us how much the master would have scrapped had he lived till now, what he would have modified of what he said before. It is his disciple should do this and more. He that hath a gospel whereby heaven is one, carpenter or camelier or Maya's dreaming son. Many swords shall pierce him, mingling blood with gall, but his own disciple shall wound him worst of all. So this leads to another speculation um and, and answer this question well you know, who's responsible here is it is it the clergy or the people that's that's responsible um well one framework the framework in the kitabi gone assigns responsibility to those who are in power and it which effectively removes individual moral agency abdul Baha explains in some answer questions this is a mercy and a kindness perhaps this is a, a narrative suitable more for the realities and exigencies of the of the past. Whereas the other framing, which we see in the in the Lahi Nasir and in the beautiful poem by Kipling, 
uh, centers the blame on us. It restores individual moral agency. As, as, as Paul said, maybe we weren't ready for it then and maybe we're ready for it now. You know, Paul during, in one of his letters says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are ye able. But perhaps part of the divine message for today is being able to take more, more meat and less, uh, and less milk. Um, but is there a larger point, if that's the case, that, well, under one circumstance, it might, the, the divine explanation might be one thing, and later on, the divine explanation might be in a, what seems like the opposite thing. Is there a larger point to this? Perhaps it's that our sacred narrative frameworks, we also call them the religions of the world, are based partly on human psychology, human development, and also partly on reality. They're partly a matter of what we are able to understand and what, what, what we can take uh, in terms of, uh, of reality at any particular time. Um, and when we look at the history of religion, we find there are multiple stories, multiple frameworks, multiple theological statements that all seem at odds with each other, some of which in the case of Baha'u'llah's writings, within his own writings, there are statements which seem to be in tension with each other. We can see these as different frameworks of explanation that are given in relation to what we call the divine, which are suited to different circumstances, different exigencies of the time. In part two of the Kitab Yigan, we're going to see another important example of multiple narrative frameworks when Baha'u'llah talks about the three degrees of divine revelation, which are really three different ways of thinking about the divine and its interaction uh, in the world. So maybe we can say something like, today, one of the real issues of today is that we are living amidst the rubble of many old narrative frameworks. And we're also living amidst the birth of a new narrative framework. Old religions are sort of, have been partly dismantled by the, uh, by the forward movement of humanity in the physical realm, by the, the doubt as to old ways of thinking that, uh, that the enlightenment and the scientific revolution have brought, old literalistic ways of reading texts, in a way, we're amidst, as as the sociologist P Peter Berger said, we're we're contemplating a landscape of smoldering ruin when it comes to these old narratives. Um, but what Baha'u'llah is asking us to do is not to reject the old narratives out of hand and say, "Well, these are finished, and these are the wrong narratives, and here's the right narrative." Instead, he's asking us to do something more subtle, which is to embrace them as stages along a journey towards maturity. Uh, and certain remedies, as, as Baha'u'llah says, he's the divine physician who brings remedies, and the remedies are suited to the illness of the age. And maybe during our collective childhood, a certain remedy was, uh, was called for, and then in our maturity, a different kind of remedy is called for. Maybe this connects to, and this is my kind of, maybe untoward speculation, uh, this connects with why Baha'u'llah in one place and say the Kitabi Ghan would say the, the clergy are, you know, are, are, uh, are the cause, which kind of takes the agency out of our own hands. But then later on, he says, yeah, actually, it was the people who were, uh, who were, uh, who were the ultimate, ultimately responsible. And, but whether we assign blame to the people or to the leaders of religion for the, for the mess of, uh, of this, widespread uh, you know, decline of, um, of of belief in the sacred and, and the widespread draining out of meaning in the world. Uh, why is it the case that this hap is happening? Why does it have to happen? Uh, why are the prophets rejected from age to age? So a little bit more speculation on this part. My suggested answer is that because free will is involved, some will always accept the truth, others will always reject the truth. But, and, and, and to imagine why this has to be the case, imagine the opposite ca the case. Imagine the case where there's a world where civilization progresses 
like you know, kind of like it has in our real world. But prophets come like clockwork. Everyone instantly recognizes and accepts them. What kind of a world would that be? That would be a machine world. That would be a world made of cogs and wheels in which there's no spark. We can kind of imagine that that's not the kind of a world that certainly that we would want to live in. Um, Stephen, I think yes. Uh, I would also say that this, you know, throughout the Baha'i writings is this whole idea of from crisis to victory, mm -hmm. and every religion is founded in crisis and emerges into victory. And that's part of its mythology, and it's a necessary part of any religious mythology. You know, for the Christians, the fact that there were only a handful of believers at the death of Jesus, and then hundreds or thousands died at the Lions and the Romans, and then, you know, it conquered the world, essentially, is a really important part of the mythology. Yes. And also that this, this alternating crisis and victory comprises cycles that are somehow embedded in the heart of things you know there's a it's it's and it's not just religions that that experience these cycles of, of crisis and victory of death and rebirth every cell in our bodies has that experiences that as well our, our individual lives also we have to die to make room for the next generation civilizations have to decline for new civilizations to take their place planets have to be burned to cinders by the by old exploding stars that they used to circle to make way for the next generation of uh of of planets and stars it's like from the smallest to the largest the the world is is characterized by cycles of death and rebirth um and when one is in the midst as we are of of the cycle of death it can be extremely hard to see the rebirth uh, and extremely hard to appreciate the power of that small band of people who are carrying that light that that will that will eventually set aflame the world again. I think um, I, I mean another way to put this in terms of I mean I'm mentioning free will as 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 a, as a phrase, but as as with certitude or true understanding or, or faith, think of free will as a kind of um, Think of it as like a placeholder in your head for some principle that maybe maybe we don't really have the right words for it. Call it spirit, call it consciousness, call it free will, call it the creative principle. We The world cannot be described solely by the mathematical laws of necessity, the inevitability of objects falling when they're dropped and and of, you know, of, of the, the chemistry of heat exchange and so forth. Um, there has to be something more. Uh, Baha'u'llah beautifully put it in spiritual terms in paragraph eight of the Kitab Egon, where he says the reason for these tests and trials, for things happening in a way that's not mechanical, um, for a way, the reason for things happening that require human input at either acceptance or rejection is something about distinguishing roses from thorns. There, there's something in the divine plan of things that differentiates roses from thorns. And we're in in the thick of that right now uh, in the world. Um, again, maybe free will is, is a very poor placeholder for that thing, that spark that the world has to have that differentiates it from just a dead world that just follows the, math, the laws of mathematical necessity. Um, there's a word that Baha'u'llah uses, mashiat, will. Uh, and that idea of will is, is perhaps maybe, maybe even a better word. Um, pure creative principle that's responsible for, uh, for everything. And of which we ourselves are individual manifestations as drops of the, of the ocean of the will. And that component of will is necessary. Um, but with that will, with that component of will in the world also comes all the other things that, that go with it. Rejection of prophets, the evil and suffering uh, that, that we experience in the world. And I'll just close this out and then open it up for, for the um, people who've raised their hands. Um, this idea I just happened to notice in, um, in a book by Alfred North Whitehead, who was um, a very profound thinker about these sorts of things, uh, about what's the ultimate 
causes, what are the ultimate causes of things and is there ultimate purpose in the world and so forth. And he had this insight that, that in the religious sphere, this sort of movement of thinking about the world in terms of necessity, in terms of, you know, say the divine right of kings whose rule is absolute, and then the birth of the individual, the birth of the idea that somehow creation is fulfilled not through coercion, but through invitation or through persuasion. In other words, through a free act of will as opposed to being forced to do something. Uh, Whitehead says this doctrine should be looked upon, the discovery of this doctrine should be looked upon as one of the greatest intellectual discoveries in the history of religion. Um, and um, just to add one, one little final bit of speculation to this, Abdu'l-Bahá in, in some answer questions also talks about the universe as kind of a circle comprising two arcs. And one arc can, can be thought of as the arc of necessity, of coercion, of this must be the case because the preceding must have been the case. This, this arc is the arc of the physical world and the laws of physics and chemistry and, and all of that that brings the world into being through all of the, 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 the mechanisms that, of which we are aware. But that, but that arc has to be completed by a complementary act of will, which is free and which is persuaded to accept the good by the beauty of it, by the love of it, not, not out of necessity. But for that arc to exist, you also have to have the possibility of, of turning away, um, and that's why, um, that's why we have divine tests. That's one way of 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 answering the question of, of trying to crack this nut of theodicy and why, why there is so much darkness in the world, uh, when, when we feel it it really ought to be uh, filled with light.